my father's mother was diagnosed with breast cancer in her early 40s and died of metastatic breast cancer a few years later. I determined through looking at death certificates that my great-grandmother was one of five girls and three of them died of ovarian cancer and two of what we imagine was serous uterine cancer. When I was growing up, the BRCA1 and 2 genes had not been discovered yet and there was still a question about whether cancer was actually hereditary. The December 1993 issue of Newsweek had on its cover three generations of women, or one of them was a girl, and the title of the article that was featured on the cover was The Hunt for the Breast Cancer Gene. I pored over that article uh, looking for answers. In 1993, we could not directly sequence the breast cancer gene because it had not yet been isolated. We could only indirectly track the risk of breast cancer through a family. There were no targeted therapies that were specific to the underlying cause of the cancer. We just had enough technology to sequence one human genome. And that one human genome was just an exciting, amazing trip of mapping this blueprint for a human. Looking back on it is that we only thought about one, when these days we think about millions. We were able to sequence the entire human genome, all of the genes, in a couple of days at a very minimal cost. Thus, we're able to provide to individuals very accurate information about diagnosis. We you know, know certain genetic causes of disease, and when we find those in patients, we can give them an answer and sometimes even direct treatment. But for most patients, they're not getting answers. I opened the New York Times one day and I saw this op-ed piece by Angelina Jolie called My Medical Choice, and it described her decision to get a prophylactic mastectomy. And I just remember, as I read it, my blood running cold, as I realized that these uh, mutations on these genes were a really plausible explanation for my family history, and that I was at an age where it was really important that I get testing. Because I am a product of paternal inheritance, I was not eligible for testing, and I would have had to pay for it out of pocket, and so testing was about $4,000. And so I sent the article to my father, and he was persuaded and went to his physician, got testing, came back as positive, and uh, a month later, I got testing, and it was determined that not only did I have a BRCA mutation as a 44-year-old woman, but in fact, I already had ovarian cancer. I'm now looking at a 13-year-old daughter and hoping that by the time she is facing these decisions, she doesn't have to decide between cutting off her breasts and being surveilled, where surveillance actually doesn't mean prevention. Surveillance means that we'll let you know when you have breast cancer, and that may or may not mean that the breast cancer is treatable. When I think about my own risk of getting cancer, it's obviously something that's very scary because cancer is a scary disease. But I am extremely grateful that we know in my family that this mutation exists, and so I know to get tested before it's too late, and I can take the preventative steps to not getting cancer. To understand both the common causes of breast cancer and the rare causes, we need to generate large data sets with many, many individuals affected with breast cancer. Literally tens or hundreds of millions of people. Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to responsibly share data between researchers in different countries. These large amounts of data are spread out across the world, across different centers, even across the street. And you can't change architecture of or existing machines to, to, to do new things. What you can do is you could have a standard that allows these two disparate machines to talk to each other. We have to have standards for how we structure that data, both the clinical information and the genetic information. So that when it comes to a particular variant in a single person, we can accurately predict for that person what to expect because of that genetic change. So we can quickly identify whether that variant has ever been seen before in the population, and if so, how common it is. We can start to work out that this drug might work for these people, 
but this other drug won't work for them. Fully realising the benefits of precision medicine will mean uh, coming up with ways of aggregating, uh, harmonising and federating each of those different databases. In the future, the way I would love to see genomic medicine happening is that when each patient gets tested and we generate a genomic data set on that patient, that we're not looking at that individual's data set in isolation and we're actually comparing it to the world's population of patients. To get to this future we will need to have federated data sets, an ecosystem of interoperable standards. The Global Alliance for Genomics and Health is setting the standards for the safe and responsible sharing of genomic and clinical data internationally. Each of these standards does a job by itself but by coordinating the way that we develop these standards they click together to solve much bigger problems than each one can do on its own. But the Global Alliance doesn't just address technical issues, it also looks at policy issues. How can we uh, responsibly and ethically share data internationally? If I find out that I am a BRCA carrier, I will definitely want to share my information with the scientific community because I think that is a really important part and an important step to finding cures for genetic and really all diseases. So often there's too much focus on the risks to privacy and not enough focus on the value that data can provide to patients in the future. As patients, um, we rely on people being willing to share their data. We understand that research is dependent upon aggregations of data. We can't get good answers without that. Researchers will want to use this data and you have to make sure that it respects consent and privacy, that's the first issue. And the second, how do you make sure that that researcher is really that person? So that we know that the right people are accessing the data when they're allowed to. And the standards that GF4GH are working on will help you do that. The sharing of genomic and clinical data is going to greatly enhance clinical care. We're going to be able to provide better diagnosis, more targeted treatments for an individual. It's not abstract tools, it's not abstract standards. We are talking about patients and we're talking about the direct impact on, on somebody's health and that's what I love about it. All of us need these standards to be able to learn from the information that we're generating every day. Data sharing is a form of quality control as it allows laboratories to identify discrepancies between their interpretations and improve them for future patients. I am a strong believer in sharing um, genetic and uh, other medical information with the scientific community as long as uh, good protections are in place and also as long as um, patients are sort of partners in the process. That's what's unique about the Global Alliance. It's using for the first time in human history a human right as a basis for an international collaboration in data sharing. I have a lot of hope for the future for my daughter and son and um, everyone else that comes after who has a, a BRCA mutation or another hereditary cancer mutation or simply has another hereditary or other disease. I feel so lucky that I know that there's a possibility that I have this mutation and that I know ways that I can prevent getting cancer in the future.